It's March, it's Italy, and a new cycling season begins. Hello again, everybody. I'm Phil Liggett, and welcome to 1997 and the longest single-day classic of them all, 294 kilometers, the 88th running of Milan to San Remo, an event which started back in 1907. It was done then by the Frenchman Lucien Petit Breton, and since then, we've seen many great winners of what is regarded as one of the best classics in the world. And right alongside me, a man who's ridden this classic, indeed, he's finished 11th in it, Paul Sherwin, joining me on the commentary. And as we join the action here, we're well into the race today, and a breakaway now of three riders, and the chase down from the big bunch. The significant thing is, the big bunch itself has shown no signs of thinning out. It's been a very quick race so far, and as you can see from the shadows on the road, the sun is high in the sky, and Paul, that's always a good feeling at this time of the year. Normally it's chilly for most people. Well, the best thing about Milan San Remo really is when you get over that first climb, the, the Col de Turcino, the riders want to get over there, they regard that as the first most strategic point of the event, and then they drop down to the coastline and everybody wants to try and get an early breakaway so they can go over the Turcino in first or second position. The, the descent down to the coast is very dangerous indeed and these riders, they broke away after almost 98 kilometers, so they rode over the Turcino alone. There was a fourth rider with them, he has now been dropped and the three riders that we're looking at are over up a very considerable lead. It'll be interesting to see though, Phil, later on which of the teams start to chase these men down because there's still an awful long way to go. Well, 50 seconds is what it says now, but the breakaway when they went over the top of the Torchino was 4 minutes and 26 seconds up, so it never really got the big escape that you might expect as we race down the coast here. And Dennis Zanetta of the Aki team, Maurizio Malinari, Eros Poli, the man that was with them but was dropped was Dario Pieri of Scrigno. And these three, the great escaper, I suppose, the netter, he's always in the moves, the big gambles, he's the rider in the yellow colours on the far side there. And uh, Molinari, number 21, he's in the same team, by the way, as Claudio Chiapucci this year, the ASICS team. And the big tall man, who's uh, st it's strange to see an Italian on a French team, Eros Poli, an Olympic champion, and uh, back in 1988 in the team time trial, and a very popular rider. In fact, he uh, has an Australian wife, and that's where I first met him. And uh, his English now is excellent. And he didn't speak a word of English when he first went over to Australia to ride in the Commonwealth Bank Cycle Classic there back in 1988. You probably remember him best, Paul, I think, for the long breakaway he had in the Tour de France when he said he went out front to look at the girls and he stayed away over Mont Ventoux and won the stage in Carpentras. That was a dramatic victory. That was a few years ago going over the top of that mount, the Mont Ventoux. And at one time I thought he was going to get off his bike and walk over there. He was <laughs> going so slowly, but he built up such a big lead, no, almost 20 minutes at one stage, that he just managed to hold on. You can see the train going alongside. Well, the main field soon will be going along at the speed of one of these trains, but Poli is a very interesting rider and the reason he's come across to the GAN team this winter in fact is because I think he wants to ride a little bit for himself we've seen him in the past riding so much for Mario Cipollini when they had the big Mercatone Uno squad then he switched across to ride with Cipollini on his new team but now he wants to just ride for himself get a few more years and see if he can get a victory of his own under his belt blue white and red jersey the champion of France down there just off to the right that's Stefan Erlo and an awful lot of riders who one, I suppose, should say shouldn't be here at this stage of a big classic race like this, but, you know, Milan San Remo really doesn't break up very easily at all. It's a one-directional race, even though it's almost 300 kilometres, the speed is invariably high. The riders find this a marvellous training race. Of course, there's only a probably 20 riders at the head of this big field, realistically dreaming of a victory down at the finish in San Remo. These three, well, they're hanging on now, and surely they are not going to stay away. As we start to now to head into the little cappies, the small mountains, small hills, they probably feel like mountains at this stage of the race. They're just around about six hours in the saddle now for all of the field. And they just come as they ripple along the coastland, and then they dive down off the Poggio right into the finish. Well, it's just inside 50 seconds now. This is Denis Zanetta, who had a very good tour of Italy last year, and he is a man who looks for the moves. He's not a sprinter at all. He looks to slip away where he can. And with a solid performer like Poli, who is an excellent man who can stay out front for ages and ages, they might have a chance, but I think that's gone now. They never really got the gap they should have got, Paul, four and a half minutes. 
Well, Phil, actually, this gap has come down dramatically, but interesting to see in the middle of the field here, number 121, the man Marco Pantani. 14 months he's been out of the sport with that injury, for, suffered in the Milan-Torino race where his leg was absolutely smashed, and it's so good to see him back in form now. He's riding very well indeed. I think we'll see him performing excellently. Just ridden the Tour of Mercy. In fact, he was the leader of the King of the Mountains competition there, and I think this is a man I'm looking forward to seeing a lot more of later on in the season. I think Pantani, it's great to see him back. I know everybody just loves this little man. It depends on uh, what you call him. The French call him Dumbo or Elephantino, and others call him the Pirate, but either way, he's a great sense of humour and a very likeable person. We're all delighted he's back. He's showing signs, too, that he may well have recovered from the terrible injury that at one time we feared would leave him outside the sport completely. I tell you what, last year in, in the Giro d'Italia, he sang the opening titles. I'm just glad he's back as a bike rider, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, he can't make his mind up whether he wants to be a bike rider, but this year certainly wants to get back to the top. These three riders now coming to the very critical phase of Milan San Remo, the Capo area, and they've got Capo Mele. Capo Berta, I always found, was the hardest one. That's when the first real decision is when anybody who's got slightly sore legs tends to get dropped. But since the introduction of the Cipressa, that has become the most critical climb of this event. And that's when we'll see the big riders then trying to open up a gap and split off 30 or 40 riders. They're going through the town of Alasio now, well known for the fact that there is a Nice Alasio Classic here. There, 58 kilometers to go. So less than an hour and a half racing for these three riders. And Phil, I think. The way they're starting to look now, I feel sure once we go into the big capos, they're going to get reeled in and we'll see a lot more attacking coming. Well, we caught sight there of Molinaris looking over his shoulder. He knows that the big feel is starting to come through. And uh, remember, Mario Cipollini is still very much in this front group. Now he's just celebrated his 100th win as a professional this season. He's already had stage wins in three major stage races at this time of the year, so he's on form. And this is the first round of the World Cup, let's not forget. And the man that gets this victory is going to be taking the next race, the Tour of Flanders, as leader of the World Cup competition. The big pack uh, queuing up almost to get through Alasio here. Well, I meanwhile, out in front, it looks like midsummer, doesn't it? It's the most beautiful area of the world at this time of the year. The temperature uh, to the rides will feel pretty warm right now. It's around about 60 degrees. In fact, you can just see at the top of the yeah. screen now that leading group of three riders. It's almost over. And very soon now, it's all going to come back together. But once they do start to get into the capos, you can see a lot of the other teams will try to launch attacks. And then we have to see who's going to try and control the event. Mario Cipollini, as you've said, he's had three victories so far this year. He'll be looking for a great win in this event, which is regarded as the race of the sprinters, one of the few with parry tours of the one-day classics that can be regarded as one for the sprinters. But nowadays, with the introduction of climbs like the Cipressa, it is so much more difficult for a sprinter to survive over the final of this race. Well, there it is, the big field, and my goodness me, it is a big field right now. It hasn't split up hardly at all yet. Now reeling in the three escapers, first time they've seen them for quite a few hours, but they've got them now, there's a couple of yards between them, and the white flag is out, they have surrendered. As Annette looks across at Eros Poli, two Italians, have a little word, probably saying, well, we did our best, we tried. And there's the caption telling us that the, uh, the main field is back together. And the field coming in is spearhead formation, so the sprinters are getting to feel as though they've got their chance again now as they reform at the front of the pack. Another little shot there of Marco Pantani. I think maybe the gentleman in the helicopter quite surprised to see this man more renowned as a climber riding one of the sprinters' races there is the indication. You just see him there in the centre of the screen, 121. Marco Pantani, the Elephantino, the pirate, whatever you would like to call him, but what a character he is. And another attack coming here from the front. Looks to me like one of the riders from Breschelat trying to go clear. That must be Borgarese, a very good man indeed. Look at the speed, though, at the top of the screen, 55 kilometres an hour. And all these riders want to steal a short march before they get to the bottom of one of the capos, so that hopefully they can just get over the top. Tomaccio Brusigin. The Shiliat team trying to go away. He's gone away. He's got to go away with great speed and full out effort to crack the bunch because you're trying to ride off the front of a peloton which is doing around about 32 miles an hour right now. But the streets here twist and turn and they duck and dive and you are quickly out of sight once you leave the town. But I think the peloton now are paying a lot of attention. They've had the big breakaway, they've chased it down. 
They will now try, the, the teams will try to keep it together for the sprinters of the race. And uh, there are other teams here who will still try to break it up and make it hard all the way to the Poggio. And then maybe the Poggio will decide as it so often does Milan San Remo. One team here, Phil, who seem to be paying an awful lot of attention at the front of the main field is the Scrinios team. They've been at the front constantly over the last few kilometres. I think they feel that their man Francesco Guidi has a good chance, Fabrizio Guidi has a good chance of getting clear towards the end because he's the kind of sprinter who can get over the climbs and then put in a magnificent sprint. But you see, they're not letting anybody get too much of an advantage here. The lead only about 100 metres. And once they get to the bottom of this climb, the man who's just been off the front for a short period of time, he'll really feel the sting in his legs and he'll get reeled in just automatically. You can see now he's fighting all over his bike, trying to get a little bit more power and the main field just hovering, ready to snap him up. It's so much easier in the pack, isn't it? The Rabobank boys are also moved up to the front to give it a handout because they've got uh, Robin McEwen as the sprinter on their bunch. Very close to the front there in the middle, Phil, with the sunglasses on as well as Rolf Sorensen he's in fine form as well this year he's also looking I think to prove that he can be a man to win some races later on this year he's moved across to the Dutch team and he's now felt a lot more at home having spent a lot of time riding for the Italian squads earlier on in his career and now again the moves coming at the front here riders all the time trying to get clear this is a little bit of inexperience trying to go clear alone at this stage of the game you need to go clear with a group of four or five riders to try and hope to stay clear in Milan San Remo Laurent Debien the Frenchman in second position on the coffee disc team he's covering the moves at the moment and hoping that something will go clear Kofidis, uh, not surprisingly, missing the performances of Lance Armstrong, who should be leading that team this year. They haven't had a great start to the season. Uh, Maurizio Fondrias, who they signed up, did well initially, but he's now out with injury and not, uh, not at all riding well with a bad back. Now they attack these short but very sharp climbs with great speed. They stay on their big chain rings and they just drive onto these climbs. A spectacular scenery as you race down the coast to San Remo and this part of Italy. But the main field uh, not taking too much time to take it all in as they concentrate now. They've got to stay alert now in this big pack because it's really, uh, reasonably speaking, the top 40 or 50 men who are taking part in the race, the rest are just riding along. Just look at the length of the peloton here and then the team cars going way off into the distance. It is a big field. I thought we might have got at least a 50 or 60 rider breakaway here over the ripples, but right now the whole field are hanging on for grim death. Um, Fabulous training, Paul, isn't it? Even if you're not going to win Milan San Remo, it sets you up really for the April Classics. It's a very long race. Another break going clear as well here. This looks like Kautz and Michelangelo from uh, the Aki team. He's opened up quite a good gap indeed. But, Phil, the thing that always amazed me about the race of Milan San Remo was when the field is completely strung out, there's almost a minute's gap from the front yeah. of the main field to the back. So if you're not riding in the front, 20 or 30 it's very difficult and you have to use an awful lot of energy to move up into the top 20 places where it is the safest place to be especially going through some of these towns on the run-in because there's lots of little fountains lots of little corners and just one touch of the brake and 20 or 30 riders can go down in a race like this and often do unfortunately but uh, largely without injury there's the big peloton now coming out of the tunnels fortunately these are the better tunnels in Italy because they've got sides to them and and if you like windows, because the tunnels that the Tour of Italy often go through are dark and damp and very, very badly lit, and that's where the accidents do occur. Now, the field are making their way through. These tunnels, by the way, are built to stop the rock falls going onto the road. You can see there's plenty of rock on the roof of this particular one, um, but this uh, does keep the road clear where necessary. Now, Michelangelo Cous has gone clear. He's only a few seconds ahead. He's having a probably hoping that somebody comes and joins him right now because he's still got uh, the big climb of the Cipressa to come and also the Poggio and also the Capo Berta. Capo Berta, I always felt, was the toughest one. This is uh, Michelangelo going down the descent. He's getting down into a very low aerodynamic position, trying to make it the advantage that he can in these corners, but the descents on the final run-in of Milan San Remo are very fast indeed. There aren't really very many dangerous ones. The most dangerous is that of the Poggio and of course the Cipressa where there have been several crashes in the past but you can see now a sense of urgency coming into the main field. You can see looking at that peloton at the bottom of the screen a lot of riders moving up along the outside trying to get to the front, trying to get two or three riders from the same team there so that they can organise themselves because they don't want anybody to go clear at the moment. They want to try and keep the main field together 
because strategies are starting to come into play. Everybody has their orders at the start of a race like this. Saiko riding for Mario Cipollini, they will soon try to, to pick up the speed, to, to pull the race back together, to try and get their men into the ideal position when it comes to the critical capos, so that he's at the front of the main field. And you can see now the, the arrowhead at forming at the front of that main field, but riders all the time moving up. It's a constant motion in the main field. So the sprinters are still living in hope, but right now it's the adventurers who've gone, Michelangelo Cows, teammate of Dennis Zanetta, who is in that long breakaway. So it's a good move to try and get back out on the attack. Here's the tight fit as we come off the descent and head down towards the next climb. One or two of the Kelme riders sitting at the back. They won't be at home in this type of classic, but the Kelme team already have had uh, a reasonable amount of success this year. 50 kilometers to go, 31 miles, approximately uh, an hour's racing, I suspect, uh, at the sort of speeds we expect from the riders in this event. And Certainly in a race like this, Phil, because the final will be run off at very much between 45 and 50 kilometers an hour, and those Kelmy riders are riding in a very dangerous position because this is one of the most dangerous classics I always felt because coming through the towns here, you've got no idea what reaction is going to happen at the front of the main field as we've got cows here trying to hold on. He knows what the course is like. All of these riders will have studied the parkour the night before. They know exactly what number of capo is coming up next and all he can hope is for a group of five or six riders to come up to him because it's very windy out here along the coast and he'd be suffering like anything to try and stay clear but on your own it's an awful long time all he can think about at the moment is that his Italian fans are cheering him home well Cows is 29 years of age and he didn't win a race last year and he did finish 163rd in this one so you could call him an outsider for victory but if you don't try you're never going to win and certainly he's taking his chance at the moment. The field, I don't think, are taking his attack too seriously, and that is often the case. They would, he's not a name that they would mark closely, and of course that's when you can spring the surprise and get away with it. But they know with the climb still to come, they should have him under control. It's a question of the combination of forms when the chase down does start, and that the riders who have intents are there going to sit near the front and just see who wants to put in the attack that will close down on this lone breakaway. Even though they're on a climb, though, you can just see from the helicopter here how quickly uh, this field is moving over the ground at the moment. And also the movement from the right of the bunch there as other riders take the chance to get that little bit closer to the lead because they know sooner or later there's going to be an attack and here it comes already. Well, these are the attacks now which you can expect to take this race all the way down to San Remo. And it's a question of whether you can mix with them. These riders now are at the sharp end of the action because every one of these attacks must be regarded with respect. Remember, Michael Angelo Cowers is the rider just in front, quite literally. And there is a fair reaction from the field here. The telecom team are trying to latch on the back too. They've got a good sprinter, of course, in Eric Zabel, a man who's riding on tremendous form this year. He's had a great start to the season. Interesting to see the Bonesto team there, not normally a team we would <laughs> no. see in the Classics. This year, obviously, the withdrawal of Miguel Indurain from the international peloton, but the Bonesto squad this year have seemed to completely change their roles when it comes to some of these races. They're taking part in a lot of races, winning a lot of races, and I think with... Abraham Alano moving across to that squad. They're going to be a very different team when we come through to the Tour de France later in the year. Alano, for the moment, though, very quiet indeed, taking a similar sort of preparation to the Tour de France as Miguel Indurain used to be. Very quiet indeed. And in fact, Indurain quite often used to ride this race, Milan San Remo, as preparation because at the end of the day, it does give you 300 very hard kilometers in your legs. But there again, you can see the attacks coming. Coffee dish at the front again, Laurent Devien trying to go clear. One of the TVM riders looks across now to see if he can open up a gap. Now this looks like it is Michael Anderson who's gone clear, the big Swede. I saw him win the Rapport Tour in South Africa a couple of years ago and he said if he didn't get a pro contract then he was going to retire from the sport. Well he got his pro contract, he's moved to TVM this season and he is a very aggressive rider indeed. You can see he's riding on the big chain wheel here on the climb. He's trying to literally, literally rip away from the field and if he can do that and this is Carlo Bowman's Paul. Now this is a man, he hasn't had a lot of success this last uh, season or so, but he never stops trying. He never stops trying. He really is a great performer. He has been the champion of his own country, but I feel he's found his role in the main field and especially in the Mapei GB squad. He's the man who will dedicate himself 
to helping Johan Museo. At the moment, he's gone out as the policeman for Mamahi GB because the man they feel can win today is Museo. He's in great form at the moment. He's had a superb start to the season, winning three stages in the early Ruta del Sol. But Michael Anderson, last year riding on the TVM squad, well, he's quite a remarkable rider. He's so strong, but sometimes he just lacks a little bit of tactical sense. Nicola Loda is the other rider who's just shot across the gap and is about to latch on to give us three up front. And Loda comes here from the tour of Langkawi, which uh, is really a tour of Malaysia. It went through all, I think it's 13 states in Malaysia this year. And the Map A team were there, and the MG team were there. And in fact, they won most of the prize money, not surprisingly, I suppose. The overall winner of that event was Luca Shinto. And uh, that was his first win for two seasons because he too was out with injury. Anyway, three riders tried to go clear. They've got a very good rider in Michael Anderson, a strong time trial rider, and he will really try to set the pace. He's opened the gap. It looks like there might be two more riders trying to bridge it as we come off this little capo and head down to the next one. Six hours in the saddle now, and so we're going to be around about 45 minutes, 50 minutes from the finish here. Still, the, the green shorts at the back of the main field here of the Kelme riders. They really are not at ease on a circuit like this. And I have to say, for when riders used to take part in Milan San Remo, very often the mechanics would have to change the brake locks at the end of the event because you have to use your brakes so many times just to avoid crashes, trying to stay in the main field. You're always on your nerves, always trying to stay out of danger. But these three men at the moment trying to keep themselves out of danger, looking for the next big climb. In fact, two riders moving up there. One of the Rabobank riders looks very much like the shape of Leon van Bon. Yeah. So five men now looking to go to the bottom of the Capo Berta together. Yeah, that's Leon van Bon, a little uh, short man, a good sprinter. Uh, stage winner in the Tour du Pont. In fact, he's won two stages in that event. And as there, somebody else has jumped onto the back of the group there as well. This is the back of the group and an awful long way from the head of Milan San Remo now. The long, thin line as the riders try to concentrate now on a, a much more serious breakaway. I didn't see the capture there of uh, Kauza, but he's certainly gone back. We've just got the three leaders and this is where we are now, heading up towards the servo. 46 kilometers from the finish but it's a difficult 46 kilometers and it looks to me as though right now Anderson and Bowman are giving this a 100% effort and the breakaway is continuing to swell uh, just a little bit here I think we've got uh, Borgarisi possibly is latched on the back it wasn't Pantani it was certainly a teammate of Pantani's and one of the casino boys they're having a great start to the year as well that's Stefan Bart just getting on the back there a man I don't know a great deal about he is a very strong rider, but you see, Casino team have changed from being one of the small French teams on the circuit. They've brought in a lot of power onto the squad this year to become much more of one of the top international squads, looking for a, a ride in the Tour de France this year rather than a wild card to get them in there. There, in fact, is Leon van Bon from Rabobank. And once again, Michael Anderson is going clear. He's got a good group here. He should stay with them and work with them, but he feels that they're not strong enough to stay with him. He's trying to go it alone, which is not a very sensible move. No, but it's a typical Anderson move. He does this all of the time. He's uh, not content with small breakaways if he feels that they're not going hard enough. And he now is going to draw out the strongest ones of this breakaway and see if he can consolidate a move himself. He looks over his shoulder, see if anybody's coming. Well, somebody is, and I've got a feeling it's Carlo Bowman just tried to go yet again down there. And so the breakaway here is split up. The main field are not that far behind, in fact, 14, 20 seconds maybe, not a lot more than that, and trying to keep this race under control now. You know, we don't see many bunch sprints, oddly enough, in Milan San Remo, although you would think it would be a sprinter's domain, but it certainly hasn't proved that way over the years. And that was Bart calling for more action at the front here. You can see just looking <laughs> down the straight field, there is the main peloton, not giving anybody a chance to get too much clear before we come up to the Capo Berta. These riders now a little bit worried because they know all the time just behind them the main field are not going to let them go. At this stage of the game, nobody gets a free ride, nobody gets too much of a lead going into these Capo areas and Carlo Bowman's sitting comfortably at the front. He's happy to be doing his job there in this group. He's got those Spinacci bars there, the ones produced by Cinelli. He's getting into a, a tuck position in the middle there, but doesn't do too much at the front. You see, swings off and makes sure that everybody else in that group does their turn. And the telecom rider we saw there, that's Brian Holm. Well, we didn't pick him out earlier, but he's also in this breakaway. And it's uh, quite a, a mixture of riders and very few Italians, Italians getting in on the scene here. And they won't be too happy with that. There's one of them, and that's Simone Borgarizzi. 
sitting there at the back of the group, but he finds he's got quite a mixture of nationalities sitting in front of him. 179 is the day in Brian Holm. Here comes the Frenchman, Stefan Bart. Loaded there in fifth position, fourth position yeah. just in front of Holm. He's waiting for the man at the front to slow down, but you see Michael Anderson is impatient. He's in second position at the moment, waiting for Carlo Bowmans to do his turn at the front. He's trying to get this group to the Capo Berta in front because there's very often a big split on the Capo Berta where 30 or 40 riders get dropped off the back. It's a tough climb, and then you plunge down to the coast again, and then very quickly you're at the bottom of the Cipressa, which I think is the most important critical part of the course these days because it really does split the main field into two. And there is the main field as they literally speed through town. This area, like all of Italy, saturated in history, much of it Roman, of course. And the towns uh, really do look very old, as indeed they are. The riders now racing down towards San Remo, which is the paradise of those who love uh, the sea and the boats, the marinas, and a big holiday resort. And at this time of the year, a most pleasant place to be. Well, there's the composition of the breakaway. I'm not too sure they've got the right man at the bottom there, Pantani. They're confusing 121 with 127, and that's Borgarizzi, uh, Pantani's teammate, who's actually made the break, and is sitting happily at the back of the line so far. Well, Phil, a little bit of picture break up there. That's the microwave link going up to the helicopter, but that is really because of the conditions out here. This is a very winding road, and every time that the helicopter gets caught between the trees and the motorbike down there on the ground, we do get that picture break up. So don't adjust your set as we look here at Michael Anderson. Again, doesn't want to stay with this group, which no. would be the sensible thing to do. He's powering away now. He's on the Capo Berta. He realizes how important this is, but look at the gear that he's using. It is quite remarkable. He's a strong rider in the leg but not quite so strong in the head <laughs> well the reason he's trying to go clear I think Paul if he, just in the distance there we're catching a glimpse of the main field there they are they're right on the tail of the breakaway and so Anderson staying to himself well I've done an awful lot of work so far and I'm getting nowhere and he's now trying to go away again in the hope that the pack will pick up the breakaway and leave him out in front by himself well it's worked before, why not now? And there's three of the breakaway now being led, in fact, by Simone Borgarici from uh, Pantani's team, Mercatoni Uno. And uh, they're trying to catch up with the Flying Swede at the moment. But they're only just ahead. I think we're looking at about 10 seconds, not much more than that. But he really does like turning these heavy gears on the climb. Look at this. It's quite remarkable because I know this climb field. In fact, it's Carlo Bowman's who's coming across now. But normally the riders would climb this on the little chain ring once they get up to the top. But this man has got it on the big chain ring. He's powering away. But now you can see a major reaction starting to come in the main field. And the riders who are starting to suffer because at the moment they've done about 250 kilometers at this point of the race. And they're starting to slip to the back. And if they slip off the back of the main field over the top of this capo, well then they won't be seeing Milan San Remo with the front group and in fact the man going out of the back there at the moment in the grey jersey now another man who's swapped teams during this winter is Eddie Seigneur a former champion of France and you can see him rolling his body all over that bike he's right on the team now of Maximilian Chandry and another good workhorse as well in fact uh, the Azabala there one of the top men of the Once squad and he'll be hoping that Laurent Jalabert will come up with the goods for them Emilio Diazabala Nice friend of mine, a great guy, but he's found a little short on training by the looks of it as he comes towards the end of this year's Milan San Remo, the 88th edition, remember? And uh, we've seen some great vintage editions over the years. Now, Bowman's leading Anderson, a Belgian and a Swede in the closing stages of Milan San Remo, and that itself is unusual because in the days of Eddie Merckx, of course, it wasn't unusual because Eddie won it seven times. But his son Axel in the pack today and it wouldn't surprise me if he tries to get onto the finish podium because everybody who feels they have the legs right now must be thinking of putting themselves into a winning position at this moment in time. Borgarese has seen the danger there. He's trying to come across the gap there, but you could actually just see those two leading riders, Carlo Bowmans and um, Michael Anderson. In fact, Bowmans was riding on the small ring, but still Anderson on the large chain ring there. And I think Borgarese may just get across. This is the time when you have to 
use the last little bit of energy because once you go over the top the race then just plunges back down into the next town so if you're not in contact over the top of this capo well then these two riders could very well see themselves going away towards the bottom of the Cipressa. Carlo Bowman's there on the small chainry visibly using a smaller gear than Michael Anderson but Anderson a very strong rider in Reed two times winner of the Tour of Sweden he rode last year on Telecom and I think the reason that they didn't keep him on board was the fact that he wouldn't knuckle under and ride to team orders always wants to ride his own race which in a big team on the international circuit you cannot do that there are days when you have to ride for the team and this is certainly one of those days. Well, TVM are probably uh, going to give him a little bit more of a freer hand. And uh, our picture breakup continues as we dodge the trees here on the way down as uh, our radio signals search for the helicopter overhead. But uh, I think you have to agree that the television and the cameramen do a marvellous job to stay with these riders. Remember, you're looking through a camera lens, you're taking 100% of faith in your motorcycle pilot because you've really no idea what he's going to do next and uh, to get these action pictures on the way off this climb. The riders now, as you can see, approaching 70 kilometres an hour on the descent, the two leaders from Belgium and Sweden. I think Borgerisi has surrendered and gone back into the main field, which is absolutely flying down this hill now. And there you can see the beauty of the coastline. San Remo is a lot further than the eye can see right now as we head off towards the Cipressa. And a hill, by the way, which was introduced into this race back in 1982, Paul showing very happy about that because uh, he'd stopped riding the race by 1982, hadn't you, Paul? Well, actually, he rode it through until 1985, but it did make a big difference to the whole race. The reason they put it in was because they were trying to stop it becoming a sprinter's race. They felt that they needed another additional climb in just to try and split up the main field because what was happening with Milan San Remo was the Capo Berta was some 45 kilometres to the finish, and then the field stayed together until the Poggio. So they wanted something to try and sort it out and favour the stronger riders to make sure that it was only the strong riders left in at the kill but Borgarese hasn't given up yet he's still in there still trying to get up to these riders at the front they're going through the town of Imperia now and in the middle of this town there is a very dangerous little fountain where the riders have to negotiate and go around it and quite often the road there is damp and wet and it's on cobblestone so it's very slippy indeed but Borgarese done a great job to resist the main field there you can just see the two leaders in front still working together you come out of this town then a couple more kilometers you've got a right hand turn and it's straight up the Cipressa. Well you can see how narrow the roads are here in the town of Imperia we're at the base station really before we swing on to the climb of the Cipressa and a massive crowd here as they stand here every year to watch the Milan San Remo come through I often think that when you're just in front of the race here you're Italian as Borgarisi most certainly is you're being carried along now more or less on a surge of adrenaline you can't seriously think he's going to hold the field off at this point a lot of riders make that mistake with Milan San Remo because many riders feel that it is still a lottery it's still within their grasp there's the fountain we were talking about a beautiful town square at the moment filled with people who want to come out and watch this race they'll watch the race go by and they'll run into the cafe next bar next door and have a good cappuccino and watch the rest of the race on TV but these two leaders hoping that they can stay clear to the bottom of Cipressa. Carlo Bowman's now working very well indeed with Michael Anderson. He knows that he's got a good horse with him here. Anderson never want to shirk any work at all there, looking across to see if there are any telltale signs on the face of Carlo Bowman's to see if he's still strong enough to stay with him. But all the time Anderson has been with these little groups, he's tried to go off the front. He's obviously in excellent form at the moment, but I think he should have tried to keep together four or four, five riders because two or three men trying to resist 70 or 80 is just impossible in a race like this. Well, there's the former champion of Belgium. He won the title in 1989. He's a good finisher as well, Carlo Bowman's. And he's a man with a big heart when it comes to a great effort. And he's got his chance here. He knows the team he's on, Mappe, that he has a realistic chance of that team helping him stay away, although they're trying to set it up, of course, for Johan Museo. But while the big pack is chasing behind, Bowman's is doing, doing his team a real favour here because he's drawing the effort of the other teams to catch him. And he might well be setting this race up now for Johan Museu, who won the world title last year. Uh, and, you know, he could win the race in the sprint. 
And that's the advantage as Borgarese here is about to get caught by the main field. He almost got across, but you see, the whole of the race at the moment, Phil, is just in a 20-second gap. Borgarese had almost got across to those two riders there. He's going to get picked up. But what, in fact, with Carlo Bowman's in the front is doing is forcing teams like Saika, who we can see at the front now of Mario Cipollini, forcing them to do the work. A little bit earlier, I could see the Batic Del Monte team with the light blue jerseys. They, too, were doing that. So the, the team of Johan Museo can take a back seat. In fact, there was the white jersey of the, the world champion there just in about... 10th position there, there is the green jersey of the champion of Italy, the man who feels that he has a great chance to win, Mario Cipollini, Super Mario, he's had three victories so far this year, but I think for him the stumbling block is going to be the Cipresse, he has to get over that climb, and as we all know, he's not one of the best climbers in the world, but when he's in good form, he could get over the Cipresse. Well, he certainly has good form, celebrating his 100th victory as a professional earlier, just before this race started, in fact, and, uh, well... Uh, you don't need any more encouragement than that really to do well, especially if you're Italian and the champion of Italy at that at the moment. I this think our Loda. man uh, making I a think, few uh, problems there <laughs> with the leaderboard there because that is not Nicola Loda. That is still Carlo Bowman's. Yes. I think the man with the Chiron back in the truck there not recognising the riders as quickly. He was hoping all the time that, in fact, Borgarese was Pantani. It wasn't, in fact, Pantani, but this, in fact, is the Saeco team of Mario Cipollini. What they want to do now is just keep the speed high so that Cipollini can stay in seventh or eighth position. He's sitting right at the back of his whole team here. They'll try and get him to the bottom of the Cipressa in the top four or five positions. Now, this is the Cipressa. This is the climb that these riders are waiting to go over. Once they go over there, then it's up to Cipollini. He's got to survive and try and stay in what will probably be a lead group of 40 or 50 riders that will split off the front of this main pack and then plunge back down to the coastline again. Well, right now, there seems to be well in excess of 100 riders in this field, probably 130, 140 riders. But the whole team, Saiko, is doing all of the pacemaking now. Orders have come out from Captain Cipollini to get to the front and bring this race back together and he'll have a chance. He must be feeling confident, otherwise his team wouldn't be working like this. He, he must have told his team he feels good and to get to the front and close the race down. And then if he can watch the moves on the Cipressa and of course on the Poggio, and he's still in with a good shot at the end, uh, then we'll see the speed of the self-proclaimed fastest man in the world. But there's still an awful long way to go and a lot of climbs to come before he'll, he'll win Milan San Remo this year. This is still a very dangerous part of the course here. So you see these riders now taking the risks. They're not very far away from that right-hand bend, which they will take. And in fact, they've taken that corner a little bit too quickly. Fortunately, there's enough road there. But in the main field, riders are taking risks all the time now, trying to get up into the first 10 or 15 positions because they know that once you get closer to the Cipressa, if you're not in the first 30, then the race is almost over for you because that is when the race will literally explode. Bowman's now, all he's doing is enough work to try and keep these two riders clear till they get the, to the Cipressa. Here we get a chance to see just exactly where these riders are. Porto Maurizio, 33 kilometers to go, just a couple of kilometers before that right-hand bend, and it's straight up to the little town of Cipressa. And you see the main field now, Phil, is starting to stretch out. They're starting to bring all of the big leaders of Milan San Remo to the front. It is becoming a very critical part. In fact, you can just see the main field. They may well pull these two riders together before they get there. Well, Bowman's, he's 33 years of age now, he's been a pro for quite a long time, but last year managed only two victories. He won uh, one of the semi-classics in Belgium, what they now call the Grand Prix E3, which is the road number of a famous highway that runs through Belgium. And the E3 Harold Becker he won last year. He finished 66th in this event, but you know, that could have been a bunch sprint because... Uh, I would think uh, the majority of the riders who finish in the main pack and you're only not far away from the actual head of the action at the finish. And right now you can't be much further away from the head of the peloton because they're closing right in now as Bowman sets the pace. Michael Anderson has been attacking now for the best part of 45 minutes one way and another. Uh, but he's never really gone anywhere despite all of that. He's had different companions and now it looks as though the Saiko team have got themselves organised and they're pulling this race back into line. Well, for one last mention of Carlo Bowman, because I don't think we'll see very much more of him, he was in fact the champion of Belgium in 1989, which goes to show he is an excellent rider with a good pedigree, which is why they can't let him go too far clear 
in a race like Milan San Remo because when it comes down to the big crunch, he does know how to win races, but that's not going to be his day today, I think, because now we have another team coming to the front, trying to take over control, trying to keep the speed high, and it looks very much as if it is still the Saeco team thinking about Mario Cipollini, but you can see other teams coming to the front now. Ross Lotto on the outside there. There's a, one of the riders from the Francaise des Jeux moving up there, and Cipollini actually has slipped back a little bit here. The confusion coming up now as all of these riders moving up to the front because very soon they realize they'll be at the Cipressa, which is why there's such a sense of urgency, and even the train has slowed down, they think, Phil, to, just to have a chance to see this field because they know Milan San Remo is one of the most beautiful races in the world. Well, it wouldn't be uh, a tape of Milan San Remo if we didn't see the train alongside the peloton. It happens every year because, in fact, as Paul says, the drivers do slow down because they allow the people on the train to have the best view possible of Milan San Remo should the occasion happen where they cross with the race. And that's it. And they've done just that. And uh, they've got a real great view, too. Now we've got the Palti team coming back up to the front. Remember, this is now the team of Axel Merckx this year, having uh, the demise of Motorola last year. Axel has gone across to Palti, and I know he's always wanted to do well in Milan San Remo because of his father, who won this event seven times, and Axel is still right up here in the head of this peloton. Moving up into third place there, you keep seeing uh, the orange jersey with the dark sunglasses of Rolf Sorensen. He too knows how to ride this race. This is one of the few classics that the riders actually come out to beforehand the week before and they ride the final 60 kilometers of the course if most of them have ridden Milan San Remo they were the Paris Nice I should say they will come and stay down on the coast for about a week or so and then they'll ride from the Capo Berta right down to the finish just so they get an idea and a feel for where everything is because it is such an important event to be in the right place at the right time and this is the right hand turn the left hand turn I should say that they were looking for we're now at the bottom of the Cipressa and everybody who feels a little bit of strength is going to try and use it to try and get clear and force 30 or 40 riders away because at the bottom we still had at least 120 riders Cipollini still in there in about fourth or fifth position and in second place there Rolf Sorensen well, I wasn't too sure about the Palti rider who swung off the front there, but I think, in fact, he punctured as he was about to make that turn because he went very wide on the bend and dropped right out of it. Anyway, we're on to the climb now. This is a nasty little climb, this. It's short and it's steep, and they're going to hit it very fast to hurt the back end of the field and try and get a split here, something they haven't been able to do all day yet as the time ticks on now to almost six and a half hours in the saddle. This is at the back of the field, and the Kelme rider's in a little bit of trouble. Well, the Cipressa is such a tough climb, which is why you have to be at the front. If you have got weak legs, then you're out of it, you're out of the story. But the front, though, is where the race happens on the Cipressa, and I just caught a sign there of the, the white jersey this year of uh, Maximilian Chianri. Again, another rider who's changed teams. With the demise of the Motorola team, a lot of these riders have split up and gone to different teams. Chianri now on the right-hand side of the picture in the white jersey there, just in about fourth or fifth position now. He's riding for the Francaise des Jeux. Now, this is Axel Merckx on the left-hand side here. You can tell by the size of the frame. This is the kind of attack that his father would put in, a little bit far out, but Axel may well have just surprised them. Well, good for him. So Axel Merckx has started the fireworks now as he launches a hot attack here. He's hit them at the bottom of the suppressor. It looks like Rolf Jermann, who's come across, former champion of Switzerland, who may just be latching onto his back wheel. And, of course, a winner of the Amstel Gold Race when he beat Gianni Bunyu in a surprise sprint uh, not so long ago. Well, Axel looking very comfortable indeed, but this is a long climb. Let's not think it's the Poggio. It's a lot longer than the Poggio. There is Jermann sitting comfortably in second position. Now, if these two riders could get a good rhythm and start to work together, then that will really throw the cat amongst the pigeons because in the main field, we don't have very many psycho riders left there. They put all of their effort in before the Cipressa just to make sure that Mario Cipollini could come in there in a good position. Now, there's another rider, Phil, trying to get across there. We have two leaders. That's Axel Merckx and Rolf Yerman, and another rider trying to get across through the trees there. I can't quite make out who it is, but it may well be that this is, it looks like one of the Onse riders. It is an Onse rider. Well, we know it's not uh, Jimeno Diaz de Bala. He's in a little bit of bother at the back. And uh, looking at it from the front here, Paul, it looks like it might be Mikel Zarabitia. Well, he's a rider, I feel. It is, in fact, Zarabitia. He's a rider, I feel, has come back an awful lot this year. He, in fact, 
was second in the Tour of Spain a couple of years ago when he was riding for Bonesto. They hailed him as the new Miguel Indurain, and then he had a very serious back injury which kept him out of the sport for two years, but it looks as if he's back, and indeed back with a vengeance because he's jumped right across that gap. Three riders at the head of their affairs on the Chipresa, but you can see by the long line of the main peloton that the hammer is certainly down, a rider's now starting to disappear off the back of this group. And there's Arabicia sitting there at the back, turn pro, back in 1991. This Paul said he had that very, very bad car crash in September in 1994. And as a result of that, he's been a long time coming back. He hasn't, in fact, won a bike race uh, since he tried from the Tour of Rioja, uh, which is in Spain, uh, back in 1992. But Merckx is the man in the driving seat, and look at that face as he now starts to move away. I wonder if he thinks at this point, this is how my dad did it, and this is how I'm going to try and do it right now. I think Axel is thinking about Axel Merckx. He always says, please don't make comparisons to my father because I'm Axel Merckx. I can never ride in his wheel marks. What he did, no man will ever do again. I can only do the best that I can do as Axel Merckx, but he really does ride with Avengers. He's got a lot of aggression, and talking to Eddie on many occasions, Eddie is astounded at how dedicated Axel can be to the sport. He's up at 6 o'clock in the morning weight training. He's out on his bike for 7.30. He really lives the life of a cyclist, a complete monk, and I think he's starting to get the payback now because he's ridden some very excellent races. Milan San Remo is not the sort of race that you would expect to see Axel in because he's a rider who really rides much better in the high mountains. The motorbike getting in the way, this is the big problem with Milan San Remo. Always the motorbikes want to get in there to get the best shot, to get the best shot for the still cameramen, for the motorbikes, for the television job. But it's so dangerous, especially on these climbs, which is why this year, in fact, only two motorbike cameramen are allowed to go up the Poggio in the closing stages of the race, just to try and keep the race clear of motorbikes. And those are the still cameramen, and uh, we're delighted to say that uh, Graham Watson is one of those chosen to do that, uh, the British photographer, who I think gets some of the finest pictures in the world. Anyway, there's the breakaway, and uh, I must say that it looks to me as though they're not going anywhere as yet, but they might be starting something here that could develop. Three more riders are trying to get off the front of the peloton. This is a little long twisting climb, then we've got the plunge down again, and then we're heading off towards the Poggio and the big finish. And the Poggio so often the springboard to the final decision of Milan San Remo. Well, Cipressa about a four and a half kilometre climb, so it's a long climb from the sea up to the top of this event here. The, you know, it really is difficult. It's not like the Poggio where you, it's almost a sprint. The Poggio is about one and a half kilometres long. This is a serious climb. You can see it's still going up to the top there, and the main field in a long line behind them. They're not going to let anybody get clear, and what everybody is hoping is they can just stay on the wheel in front of them and that the man behind them is going to crack. But another move going here, Phil, everybody realising how important the Cipressa is, and they're leaping across, and it looks as if we're going to have a group now of four or five men at the head of affairs. But you know, even as you speak, Paul, look at that. The whole field seems to be trying to scrabble the way across to the front of the group. This is Johan Museo, the world champion, the first we've seen of him today. And so he must be feeling a little bit frisky. He's got on his wheel there, Stefano Della Santa. And he is a very good stare, one of Marco Pantani's teammates. Uh, Zsa Laurent Jalabert is there in the Anse team, uh, fresh from his second victory in Paris-Nice. So now these are the men who we would expect to see at the front at this stage of the race. Della Santa, a vastly underrated rider now, looking quite cool on the right of our picture. Uh, you have to say the same, I suppose, too, for Zsa Zsa Paul. Well, most certainly, Jalabert riding very well this year. A lot more consistent than he has been over the last couple of years. I think this year he feels that he's going to walk away and win the Tour de France. He feels he's got the strength to get over the mountains, but still attacks cupping thick and strong. And in fact, De La Santa trying to go clear again. I did catch a sign there of Richard Virenque, which is strange to see a man like him in the final phase of Milan San Remo. The, the rider for Festina, he was in about seventh or eighth position there, but De La Santa now realizes there's not too far before they get to the top of this climb of Cipressa. If he can go over the top with a gap of 10 or 15 seconds, he can stay clear down to the bottom, but then it's a very long way along the coast then to the next big climb, the final climb of the Poggio. So, De La Santa, now the Italians will be feeling as though this really is their race again because having seen most of the day with riders uh, not Italian set the pace, they've now got somebody at a crucial stage of the pace sitting right there at the front. And De La Santa, no wins to his credit last year, but even so, he's a man who's often in the thick of the action when it matters. And he's now got himself a little gap as we come up towards the top of the Cipressa. 
A bit of confusion there because I don't think anybody was expecting the attack to come from De La Santa. Museo's attack was expected. You saw Laurent Jalabert react straight away there. They weren't going to let him go clear. But now De La Santa's not one of the big challengers for Milan San Remo. So they don't know. Shall we give him a, a little bit of lead? Shall we chase down? Is your team going to chase? And you can see what's happening now is riders are trying to go across in ones and twos. But there's been a serious split in the main field there. And it looks as if, to me, it's down to about 40 or 50 strong now. So we've got rid of a lot of the riders who've been hanging on so far in Milan San Remo. But now that move by De La Santa is once again forcing a little group going clear through the town here of Cipressa. About another five or 600 metres, they're going to turn left and plunge right back down to the coast. And these three are going across to what I think I've just spotted two riders ahead of these three. And as Paul has said, there has been now a split in the peloton. It looks about 50 riders now trying to chase them down. And the man in the orange jersey there, I think, is Rolf Sorensen. Looks like his position very low on the bars there. He rides for the Rabobank squad and he's looking for the breakaway today. He knows that this is a chance once they go over the top here of opening up a slight gap, 22 kilometres to the finish, but in that 22 kilometres is the very savage climb up to the top of the Poggio. De La Santa now looking very comfortable indeed. He's got the gap that he wants. He won't be worried about what's happening behind. He has to keep a consistent speed up, making sure that his gears are right. He'll know this descent very well indeed. The riders, oh, and there's been a problem at the back. This is last year's winner, Phil. This is Colombo. He's gone down in a crash at the back of the main field. There was a number of fallers there, and uh, that's probably the reason why the race has been splitting up on the climb. Now, that is very, very sad indeed, especially for Colombo, who was right there in the thick of the action, taken out by a crash on the Cipressa. And the field that will take full advantage of that tumble because they've got themselves a front group now. One or two men just out in front. But, you know, this could all come together again for the Poggio. Well, this is the descent now. There's the first corner of the Cipressa. That very first corner you can see in the middle of the screen, in fact, is what was the end or the beginning of the end of Jan Ras's career. In fact, he came round this corner one year in Milan San Remo, pushing it a little bit too hard, went over the top, and ever since that, he had very bad back problems and never became the man that he was before. But certainly a serious split in the main field now, just 40 riders at the head of affairs. And looking back up the road there, it looks to me as if this leading group now of 40 riders is the the leading group that's going to contest the finish. You can see there, they're starting to close down on that little group that De La Santa forced clear. They're going to plunge down to the coast and then it's just a short bit of flat road and then again, once up to the top of the Poggio, they're going to plunge down into the streets of Milan San Remo. De La Santa still at the head of affairs, taking it very gingerly round these corners, you know, because he realises there's a serious drop-off to the left-hand side there, but every time he gets a little bit of a chance, he accelerates and picks his way around these corners. Well, as we watch them go down the twists here of the Cipressa, we now know that, in fact, Kevin Livingstone, the American rider, was involved in that crash. And the first reports are he has a broken collarbone, and that really is very sad because Kevin was coming into some great form. So much so, in fact, the Cofferty's team had elected him to lead them to the finish today and be the captain of the squad. So that really is bad luck. It happens, I'm afraid. Uh, let's hope Kevin recovers very quickly. Normally with a collarbone, providing it's not too badly broken, he'll be back in about 10 to 15 days. That is a shame because he had great form in Tirreno Adriatico recently, which is why Bernard Kilfen felt that with the withdrawal of Maurizio Fondrius from the Cofidis team with his serious back problem, that Kevin Livingston would have a chance when it came down to an event like Milan San Remo. So it is a shame to see him go out like that, but it will be good to see him come back strong later on in the season and maybe get a pick for the Tour de France because he's a rider who's exceptional in the climbs, but the man who's riding well on the descents at the moment is Stefano De La Santa. But in fact, the group coming back to him, there's one man in that looked like Rolf Sorensen. He knows how to descend very well indeed. And in fact, Phil, a group of about five riders starting to build up at the front with 40 men chasing. Well, Sorensen's been in at the kill before in Milan San Remo. He usually leaves his fast descending until he's coming off the Poggio. But right now, it certainly is him. He's now trying to bridge the gap over to De La Santa. And I think one of the other riders chasing down there, Paul, is Franco Ballerini. He's a great classic man. Well, another man from the Mape GB squad, one of the top squads in the sport of the cycling at the moment. You know, they really are one of the most 
top teams throughout the world, in fact, for taking part in all of the events. They can ride the Tour of Italy, they can ride the Tour de France, but they've also got a representative team when it comes to the one-day classics. If it is Ballerini, that would be a surprise because I would have expected him to be basing his year a little bit later on in the events like Tour of Flanders or even something like Paris-Roubaix. But for him to be up there at the moment is good for Johan Museo because if he can stay in the front and that group of 40 comes back, then Museo will have a man to lead him out when it comes down to the final sprint. Well, we're going to all will be revealed now as we start to move down. This is Zalabitia, who's been in the action already, now trying to stay in the action. Whether he's coming up or going backwards, I'm not too sure, but that is Franco Ballerini. There he is, and he's latched on to the other riders in front. And I think, you know, there's a TVM rider here, Paul, and that could be Van Pietergum, and there he is nearest the camera. So that's the composition of the Bregle. Van Pietergum also uh, having a good start to the year, but somebody else has gone. Now, that can only be the style of Rolf Sorensen, who's gone for gold. And you see how he was trying to use the motorbikes there. All of the motorbike cameramen trying to get out of the way, the way of that leading group. But Sorensen's such a clever rider. He's using the motorbikes, accelerating to get by just to get a little bit of a slipstream effect there. And Ballerini noticed the danger. He was straight across there. This looks like Kai Hundemark now here from the telecom squad. He's moving up the front there. He's not going to get any help at all there from Martin Denbacher, the champion of Holland there. He just sits up. He knows that he's got Peter van Pietergem. Second position now, the white jersey, Johan. Museo. What does he do now? He's got Ballerini in the front, but he feels as if he's got very good legs. There is Eric Zabel in the pink, but this is a serious group of 40 riders now. Everybody there was Claudio Chiapucci in that group as well, so a serious group has gone clear over the Cipressa, but who's going to chase? Because one or two of these riders have got serious teammates in the front, and Museo looking round to see if one of the other teams will chase, because he's such a calm man when it comes down to something like this. I'm not going to do it. Well, this looks like Claudio Chiapucci has gone down the inside and launched an attack, and Stefan Erlo has gone with him, the champion of France. And the long line has quickly reacted to that now as they're really working very hard to bring back that breakaway. And uh, they now the long, thin line, but so many different teams represented here at the front in the chase now. Zabel, an interesting name, has come right to the front. That's why the telecom team were also contributing to the chase with Kai Undertmarkt. In fact, there, Stefan Hullo, I was surprised. I thought he was trying to lead out Maximilian Chiandri, who was actually on his wheel at the time, but he accelerated and Chiandri let him go. But here is Pantani. We've seen his number on the screen several times today. We saw him in the early part of the course, 121. Marco Pantani in the lead group in Milan San Remo. Well, Phil, that is a favourable announcement for, I think, later on this season to see the little climber, the pirate, Elefantino, whatever you want to call him, but the man of the mountains at the front in a race like this is remarkable. It's great news, it's great news for everybody. We look forward to him competing, uh, firstly in the Tour of Italy, which he's declared as his target, and then hopefully after that he will come on to the Tour de France. Still one rider out in front, but the main field seems to be coming more or less back together again here. This is Den Backer, I think, yep. from the TVM squad. He's gone out of the front, and I think, in fact, I saw the hand of Franco Ballerini go up there as if he'd had some kind of a problem. He was looking for his team car, but in the final phase of Milan San Remo like this, when there's only a short distance between the groups, very often your team car isn't behind you. Now, Dembaka going clear here. He's going to throw the cat amongst the pigeons once more. He's going to try and get to the bottom of the Poggio. And now the teams have to make sure they keep the whole of the race together because this leading group of 40 now want to go to the bottom of the Poggio. And you can just see the pink jerseys at the front there. That's the telecom team. Now they feel if they can get their men, Eric Zabel, over the top. This is at the back of the race. Now this is Colombo, number one, last year's winner. Looking for somebody to help. Come on, you guys. Let's all work together. Milan San Remo's not finished, but nobody's going to help. And I I think I just saw Hank Vogels, the Australian rider from Gann, but that's at the back. The race is happening here at the front with Martin Dimbaka going clear. Well, in that crash, apparently there were some 20 odd riders came down, although we only saw one or two of them left on the road when our camera caught up. Uh, but that was quite a serious pileup, and the worst injured, sadly, is uh, Kevin Livingstone of the Cofidis team. Martin Denbacher, the champion of Holland then, having a little go now. Everybody, it seems, can find the strength to get off the front, but they can't hold the speed up, and the field are chasing them down one by one. More or less all together again now. We're on the link road, if you like, the valley approach now to the last climb of this year's Milan San Remo, and that is the Poggio Hill. And everybody in this front group, and there's around about 40 of them still in contention. We've seen one or two notable ones, but I can tell you now the one we have 
haven't seen is Cipollini and I don't think he's made the split. He was either delayed by the crash or his legs have cracked but he's not in this front group of some 40 riders. So that is bad news for the champion of Italy. It's going to be hard for Martin Dimbaka when he comes to the Poggio because using the big gear that he's using along the coastal road here is such a savage change when you take the right-hand turn and go up the Poggio because you're using a, one of your biggest gears here, something like 53 times 12, which is a massive gear that these riders will use. Then you've got to change to the complete other end of the scale when you hit the Poggio. And I think he's now just starting to run out of steam because everybody's trying to pull this race back together. It's difficult to see from the helicopter just exactly which teams are taking control of the race but I'm fairly sure in fact it's going to be one of the Pulte riders going clear again that looks to me as if that could be Gualdi and he's followed by one of the Lotto riders well it is medical Gualdi and he's got the little bit of a gap now Lotto Mark Wouters is my bet it looks like him and it is Mark Wouters who's coming across from Lotto and so we've got two riders now trying to scramble the way onto the Poggio first. Mark Vout is another surprising rider who again attacks at seemingly the right times but doesn't always have the strength to put home the attack. But he's looking for the move and that'll please uh, Jean-Luc Vandenbroek, the manager of the Lotto team. So this has been a most interesting race, Paul, because the Italians have not played their usual dominant role in the event. Well, they've been very quiet so far, apart from the fact that we did see them trying to keep the race together before the climb of Cipressa, trying to get Mario Cipollini there, but I think they bet on the wrong horse today because I think Cipollini got a little bit of indigestion when he got to Cipressa and wasn't able to get his big body over there. And now it's the other teams who are starting to attack. Let's not forget that Gualdi rides for one of the Italian squads, but now another amount of pressure coming on the front. That looks like the Francaise de Jeu. It's a very strange jersey they've got there. It's a white jersey with grey shirts and shorts. So it's, it's hard to pick out from the helicopter there, but they'll be looking at Maximilian Chandry, 12 kilometers to go. They've got a tunnel to go through very shortly, and then it's straight up the Poggio, and that is when everything will open up, and everybody then will give their last possible chance at trying to get clear for the last time, because normally in a race like Milan San Remo, the man who goes over the top first is the man who gets down to the finish first. And there's the determination of a man at the back there with his mouth wide open in Medico Gualdi sitting on the black wheel of, uh, of the Lotto Man Vouters. There's the tunnel Paul Sherman's just told us about. And for a minute you'll go into deep blackness and you'll blink and uh, it's not a time to be wearing sunglasses for the next few minutes anyway. But there's the field travelling at around about 42 kilometres an hour. They are into the tunnel. We can't go into the tunnel, of course. We'd lose all our pictures, so we have to wait till the riders pop out the other side. This is the back of the main field, just to show you that uh, very much impetus has gone out of the the chasing group here and I think it's that leading group of 40 riders who are going to in fact dispute the victory here these two riders are now out of the tunnel very shortly looking for the right hand turn away from the coast up the Poggio Gualdi at the front putting the pressure on Wouters doing enough to try and keep them clear in fact they've opened up quite a gap there Phil it looks to me as if it's round about 10 to 12 seconds so this could be the big surprise of Milan San Remo if they don't get themselves together I'm sure soon though we'll see the Mape GB team come to the front to try and nail these two riders down for Johan Museo because he feels I think with three stage victories in the Ruta del Sol this year that he's got excellent form and now there's a hundred percent commitment by these two you only get one shot and uh, the thought going through the mind there of Wouters is if I can just get onto the Poggio there may be a chance and it's not far away now it is so often decided in Milan San Remo, but it has also given us some very exciting finishes. Remember the chase back of Moreno Argentin by Sean Kelly in 1992. Kelly took many, many risks on the descent. He caught Argentin almost in sight of the finish. And the great victory by Maurizio Fondrias when he outspinned Luca Gelfi in a breakaway there. And of course, the win last year for Italy by Gabriella Colombo. Well, we can safely say that won't be repeated this year. Colombo in that group at the back now having been delayed by a crash of some 20 riders on the climb of the Cipressa. Martin Dembaka from the TVM squad at the front here in the red, white and blue of the Dutch national champions. He's trying to get a little bit of encouragement to the other riders in this group to pick up the pace because they don't want to throw Milan San Remo away. Let's not forget they've been in the saddle now for 285 kilometres. They've got to keep the pace up. They've got to make sure that everybody works. One or two there of the riders of TVM moving to the front. There's Peter Van Pietergem in about third or fourth position. He was in that breakaway a little earlier, but still, it's the pink jerseys on the front of the telecom riders. I would think still Kai Hundemark, a man who himself 
in the past felt that he had a great chance of winning a race like Milan San Remo. He's got a very good sprint indeed, but today he's working for another telecom man in that main field there. That'll be Eric Zabel. Well, the telecom, uh, there was rumours they were going to pull out of the sport, but last year with the great victory by Bjorn Aris and indeed the first and second place overall in the Tour de France, Jan Ulrich and the best team in the event, well, you couldn't leave the sport at that time, could you? So they're staying in and uh, the German team is really riding on a high now. But right now, these are the two leaders as we come into the closing kilometres of the 88 Milan San Remo, Mark Wouters of the Belgian Lotto team and Melko Gualdi of the Italian Polti team. They are only just ahead. There is really nothing in it. This has been a very vigilant race this year. The big pack have watched every move. They've allowed nobody to get very far ahead at all. Not even the traditional long breakaway. It only made a, a gap of around about four and a half minutes in total. Those riders who are wiped out uh, after about um, three or four hours in the lead. Well, it's becoming desperate now, Phil. You see the way Gualdi came through there. He knows that he wants to get clear. He knows that this is the last final phase of this race here. Mark Wilds is not a great winner. He had one victory last year, a stage of the four days of Dunkirk. But there's a, a lot of urgency coming into the race now. They know that time is running out. They're both starting to look over their shoulders. They're waiting for the reaction to come from the main field. And look at the face on Wilds here as he takes the first corner. Now they're on the slopes of the Poggio. They're hardly 10 seconds is the difference between. And surely now somebody's going to try and come out of that pack. That has always been the tactic over the last few years of Milan San Remo, using the Poggio as a launching pad for one or two men to try and get clear. Looking down there, I still can't see the main field, but Gualdi punching the bike. He really is forcing every last little bit, but now Wouters looking over his shoulders. He realises if he can hold on to this wheel and get over the top, well, then they can take all the risks necessary on the descent, but for them, it looks now as if the acceleration has come fill in the main field and they're all back together once more. Well, Gualdi gave it his best shot there, but you just can't hold off a field like this that won't give an inch today. And, you know, we've never had a bunch sprint in Milan San Remo since Pierino Gavazzi, and that was 17 years ago. But the way they're riding this race today, we've got Konishev on the front here at the moment, the Russian rider. He got a, a silver medal in the World Championships at the expense of Sean Kelly when he finished behind uh, Greg LeMond in the 80s. That was the first Russian medal by a professional rider. And now we've got Konishev setting the pace. He's got this race back under control. Not too far away from him was the yellow jersey two of Laurent Jalabert. Let's not forget Jalabert's won this race in the past too when he got away with Maurizio Fondriest. He'll be looking, I think, to attack when we come up to the last kilometre. It's a very tough last kilometre. If you've got the power, you can open the gap. There's the white jersey on the right now, Johan Museo. You can see him moving up, he realises, but Phil, there that doesn't seem to be the, the major speed of anybody who's going to try and launch an attack. There's one of the MG boys going clear there. I think that's Michele Bartoli trying to open it up, but they're going after somebody who's already leapt out of the pack. Well, somebody's already gone here. I'm not sure who it is, but we've got... It could be Roberto Petito, you know, the rider who's really on form. He's just pulled off a great win in Torino Adriatico. That's the big build-up race in Italy for Milan San Remo. It is uh, the tall figure of Petito. He's caught up with our cameraman. Had to slam his brakes on rather hard. And now, I think it is Bartoli who's trying to get across the gap here. Now, this might be the move. The Italians are getting themselves under control again. Well, this is how Giorgio Furlan won Milan Tarimo when he won it. He won the Tirreno Adriatico before he had the power. He came here to Milan San Remo. He waited till the very last moment and he rode away from everybody on the Poggio. But Petito hasn't opened up the gap yet. You can see Michele Bartoli knew the danger was going to come. He's closing down the gap there. And I think just behind him, I can see the white jersey of Johan Museo. So Museo is not laying down arms yet. Oh, he's oh. used all the road there, Phil. I don't know how he kept that up there. There was a grid in the road and he just managed to flick his bike around it. Well, that was amazing. And this is uphill at overshooting the bends. That's the sort of desperate attempts they're making now to try and crack this field. I think the White Jersey Museo has got across the gap. He's there in third place. He might well be marking the wheel uh, of Bartoli, who is a man right on form, second overall in the Tour of the Mediterranean, won the Laguilia Trophy, won the stage of Toronto Adriatico, an obvious favourite now for Milan San Remo at this stage. And TVM going. And Peter Van Pietigem once again. This man has been at the front several times during the race here. He's got up there with the motorbikes, which is why they've taken out all of the motorbikes, because they so often have fallen falsified the event, he's up there, he's using the motorbike who can't accelerate, he's getting onto the slipstream, it's not illegal because he's not in the way, the motorbike's in the way, Van Pietigem could cause a surprise now, he's opened up the gap, this is the man who won Het Volk earlier in the year, he's got a great turn of speed but the reaction is on him behind, but what a move by Van Pietigem. 
Well, it's good to see TVM have had a great race here today. Don't forget, Michael Anderson attacked for a long way, softening up the field. Maybe he was doing it just to soften up the field uh, for Peter Van Pietergum, who has great form, as Paul has said, this year won the Belgian Classic Het Volk, which is uh, the Ghent, Ghent race. And now on the attack once again. And this field very much under pressure now. It's unusual to see a rider from Belgium out in front at this stage, but there we are, and there he is, and he's still got plenty of fight. The Poggio climb always frightens me, Paul, because of these tall walls. I always think the rider's going to scratch their elbows. They ride it literally wall to wall. They ride it wall to wall, but they're waiting for just one thing, that once you get to the end of that wall, there's a left-hand turn, and that's where the descent starts. This is Van Pietergem at the front here. He knows his climb. Every professional rider knows the Poggio. They've seen it so many times on TV. They know what it's like over the last four or 500 meters. They know if you can get to the front there and turn left, then you just plunge down to the finish. There's Michele Bartoli now, the MG rider coming across there. Musea is a little bit further back in the white jersey. There's Laurent Jalabert, and it may well all come back together. Van Pietergem still in control, but Bartoli right behind him. Well, it's a pity the motorbikes feel they have to be in to get these po photographs because they are getting in the way again. Bartley dodging amongst them now. He's caught Van Pietergum. Jalabert is also there. So is Johan Musea. He's watching Jalabert. So the world champion and the World Cup holder are now marking the number one in the world, Laurent Jalabert, who keeps on switching places at the top of the classification there with his teammate Alex Zuller. Uh, but he is a superb all-round bike rider, Jalabert, and he's just had a very convincing win in Paranese. But Bartoli is now making his bid. And Peter Van Pietergem has gone. He's nowhere. He went straight back through the main field. They just once he got caught, he had no power left. He gave every last little bit. But Bartoli has certainly opened up a gap. This is the kind of man who can stay clear. This is how he won uh, Tour of Flanders last year. He went away on the Mur de Grammont and stayed clear to the end. He's getting down into that aerodynamic position. Somebody's coming across him now. There's a yellow jersey. It may well be that of Laurent Jalabert. Nobody knows exactly how much energy they've got left, but they realise if you don't close it down, there's the left hand bend that all of the riders are waiting for now the descent is on they're going to plunge down into San Remo and it looks to me Phil as if they've only five or ten seconds over the rest of that leading group of 40 absolutely nothing Paul and this is a very dangerous descent especially when the whole field now feel that they have a chance of winning Milan San Remo well it's not exactly the whole field but around about 45 riders in that group and they all could take it out if luck was on their side now the long descent there's only a short run off the mountain to the finishing line and Michele Bartoli, the man who everybody said is one of the biggest talents in Italian cycling. Well, maybe this year he's going to really show it to us all because he is a great bike rider. And here he is now leading the charge off the Poggio Mountain down to the finish in San Remo. The rider's in the saddle now for the best part of seven hours and it's still anybody's race. And all the big names, except perhaps Cipollini, are in this group. Well, information coming to us, Phil. In fact, that is Andrea Ferrigato is the man in the yellow jersey. They're coming across to get in contact and also you Johan Museo, but their gap is only 10 or 15 metres over the rest of that group. So what a move by Ferrigato, winner last year of two of the World Cup races, the big challenger to Johan Museo in the overall standings of the World Cup. But still, it looks to me as if they go into these final few corners, as if it's all going to come back together. And I'm so happy to say at this stage of the game that, in fact, Milan San Remo has returned to its proper finish of the Via Roma. They started a few years ago trying to finish it just at the bottom of the podium, but now it's gone back to what I think is one of the most beautiful avenues in the world to finish a bike race on, the Via Roma. There is Ferrigato at the front, Michele Bartoli now dropping down into second position, and the white jersey of the world champion, Johan Museo. What a player. This man really, at the end of last year, was going to give up cycling, and here he is, winning three stages so far in the Ruta del Sol, right on form, looking for a win in Milan San Remo with the rainbow jersey on his shoulders. Indeed, and everybody says when you become a world champion, the following year when you wear that white jersey, it's something of a curse because you hardly win a bike race. Well, already Johan Museo has put the lie to that. He is riding like a world champion. He's right there in the thick of it now. And Andrea Ferragato shot right to the fore last year with two World Cup victories. He won the Leeds Classic, then he went and won again in Switzerland. He has all of the confidence required now to pick up this Classic as well. And let's not forget, he is a Italian. And you know, they're not getting away from this field, Paul. Where 
work as they might, the whole pack is staying with them. Well, it's all together now. This is Rolf Sorensen deciding it's his turn to try and have one more go. Now, he's been aggressive. He was away over the Chipressa. He tried to go away along the bottom of the Valley Road, going to the Poggio, but now it's back together. Sorensen trying one last chance. He realizes if there's a little accident behind him or somebody misses a corner, he can open up five or ten lengths clear, and that could be all that he wants. But you see, the main field is all together. The whole of what remains of the main field, 45 riders fighting it out now at the end of this descent. They've got two or three kilometers, and they're looking for the victory in the first World Cup race of this season, Milan San Remo. Sorensen's still at the front, but everybody's with him. Well, Sorensen was, was involved uh, when Sean Kelly took off and caught up with Moreno Argentin, and Rolf just couldn't hold the wheel of Kelly that year. Uh, Kelly just took so many risks, but again, Sorensen is up near the front. So too is Dmitry Konishev, the Russian rider on Ross Lotto. He's right there near the front too. Only a little gap opening up at the front, though. This is Konishev now leading the charge down, and uh, Sorensen tucked into his back wheel. But they're going absolutely nowhere, and if, this come, if they come off the mountain in this formation, then the whole pack is going to close right in on them and we are going to get the first bunch sprint we'll have seen here uh, since Gavazzi 17 years ago. Well, Sorensen tries again, but there are no more dangerous corners left at the top part of the descent. There are one or two very sharp bends where you can open up. They're down in the town now. Sorensen taking over the lead there, but who's going to lead out the sprint? These men are all over the road. There are 45 men now feel as if they've got a chance of winning Milan San Remo. Museo is in there in the white jersey. Laurent Jalabert is there. He's won this race before. He knows how to win the sprint but he won't have any teammates with him now, I don't think there's any team left in this field here now that's got two or three riders to try and lead it out so it's going to be a very dangerous sprint Sorensen he doesn't want to give up he doesn't want to wait for the sprint he's going straight away down the left hand side and in fact you're right I've seen a couple of Ross Lotto riders here they'll try to help out Konishev I suspect also Stefan Erlo is trying to get across the gap again he's lying in third place the champion of France so he's had a tremendous ride today and we've got something like these 40 men slowly but surely are coming back together well he's trying to let set it up for Maximilian Chandry so there are two riders from the Francaise de Jeu there was another Mappé jersey there I think it was still Ballerini but it was difficult to see at the speed these riders are going at the moment they're trying to break clear there, but all the time it's little attacks coming they're slowing down now there's about two kilometers to go there on the left hand side you can see is Stefan Erlo another attack coming through here that looks like one of the GB riders he'll try and set it up for Johan Museo moving up into fifth place there I think is going to be Maximilian Chiandri this is Ballerini on the front trying to get a position there for Johan Museo he knows that that man has got a great sprint just around the corner now right on the side of the railway station very soon they'll be in the Via Roma and it's going to be an incredible sprint Phil and we've got about 30 riders, no more, but we are going to see the first brunch sprint for 17 years. Nobody will get away from this lot now. Franco Ballerino, the man of the classics, uh, trying to lead out. Uh, not a man he would like to lead out, Stefan Erlo, who's going to fancy his chances here now. The champion of France right in the thick of the final showdown of Milan San Remo. There's the time to be racing in about a minute's time. It'll all be over for them now. Franco Ballerini is going to have to lead the charge now. He's got no choice. Also trying to make a move there is Bartoli. Museo is in the white, just off to the left of our picture. This is going to be a tremendous run for the line now. Eric Zorbel goes on the right of the picture here. As he comes up the line, there's a bit of crash. And in fact, that was Museo who went down and Jalabert. And that was a tremendous fall. It took the shine away just that little bit. But Eric Zorbel has become only the second German rider ever to win Milan San Remo. And left in the slipstream there. And in fact, Max Chandri is lying to the right of the finish. What on earth happened there? Let's have a look again here now as they make their dash for the line this is Zabel coming through on the rails well clear of the field Alberto Eli is the casino rider with his tongue out trying to hold his wheel and in fact uh, that camera shot isn't going to really help us because the crash has happened directly behind Zabel crosses the line there is Johan Museo the World Cup holder for, and in fact he's held that for two years and the world champion. Now let's have a look from this angle here. Zorbel's on the right but go a little bit deeper into the pack here as they scramble for wheels. In fact, Jalabert moving across here and the field, it's Jalabert who starts to move and seems to lean heavily onto Museo and pushes him completely off his bike. 
Now, I'm not too sure whether Jalaba himself lost uh, his balance and just fell onto Museo. I'm sure it wasn't intentional. They both have come over the finishing line and other riders down in the crash. Certainly, Chiandri fell as well. Ellie gets the second place. Third place will go to Conti of the Scrigno team. Quite an unusual result in the end, isn't it? And here comes a bike. That gets placed, but you've got to have a rider on it. And in fact, that looks like it might be the bike of Maximilian Chiandri. And there's Max coming over the line as well. And, you know, that was uh, reminding me rather of the fall a couple of years ago, Paul, when Sean Kelly won, uh, although he came a lot earlier. I think Max was involved in it then when he was with Motorola. He certainly was. Several riders came down in that crash too, but you can see this is a clean sprint by Eric Zabel. I think what happened to Laurent Jalabert, he was panicking a little bit. He came across and he hit the back wheel of Rolf Sorensen and brought down Johan Museu. But he's done nothing to spoil the victory of this great cyclist who could well go on, you know, to become the winner of the World Cup. He's certainly the leader after this first event. Only the second German ever to win Milan San Remo. The other one was Rudy Altig back in 1968. And there is the result. Zabo wins ahead of Alberto Eli and Biagio Conti and Casagrande. Francesco, by the way, this is. He gets fourth. And Bartley, despite that late attack, still had the legs to get a home in fifth place. Well, it's been a marvellous Milan San Remo, a very aggressively hard Fort event like all good classics should be. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm Phil Liggett for Paul Sherwin saying until the next time, goodbye.